Good evening, and welcome to Having a Drink with Mink. I'm your host, Jason Mink. There are few things in nature as loathsome as the parasite, attaching itself to a healthy organism, then draining, depleting its life force, its vitality, its energy, leaving nothing behind but a husk. But we're not talking about my love life, we're talking about the vampire, of course. As you can see, we are surrounded by Draculas. It's a Drac attack, folks, so I hope you have a crucifix on hand, maybe ground up a little extra garlic in your pasta tonight, and of course, enjoy a nice beverage. I know that I always do. We're going to get right to it. Um, A little bit of context. I knew who Dracula was before I knew George Washington or the Tiny Bull Man. Um, From a very, very early age, the concept of monsters like Dracula, Frankenstein, and the Wolfman was uh, with me. What can I say? Some of us just take to that stuff. Subsequently, some of my earliest toys were monster toys. Uh, Even five decades on, as you can see, that uh, trend continues. But we're going to look back a little ways and uh, see where all this Dracula toy stuff started. Let's do it. The first Dracula toys were not toys at all, but instead model kits, and with good reason. Hasbro wouldn't popularize the concept of the boys' action figure until 1964. By then, Aurora Models had already been producing Dracula product for two years. The company's line of models were hugely successful, bolstered in part by their appearance in the Warren magazines like Famous Monsters of Filmland. Aurora offered a basic representation of Drac, along with this fanciful concept car take on the count. Sadly, Ideal Toys never produced a Dracula costume for their popular Captain Action line, which is a shame, as I'm sure the introduction of some good old-fashioned monsters would have been welcomed by the kids of the day. We had to wait until 1974, but by then, the floodgates had well and truly opened. Not only did industry leader Mego include Dracula in their Mad Monsters line, but AHI emulated Mego right down to the packaging and branding for their own world's greatest super monsters. Other smaller companies like Tomland and Lincoln offered Drac and his fellow creeps in a similar scale to the Migos to varying degrees of success. Notable was Remco's line of energized monsters, able to seize their opponents in their monstrous grasp. Ideal even saw to it Drac and Frank could get around thanks to the release of the Scare Cycles, which are highly prized today. The 1990s were a patchy time for the Universal Monsters. The characters were popular, but the popularity didn't attract high-quality licensors, leading to some crummy product. In fact, it wouldn't be until 2000's line from Sideshow Toys that Drac and his companions once again received the respect they deserved. More plastic incarnations followed, including the first representation of Marvel's version of the Lord of the Undead. Dracula was one of the newly returned Migos' first offerings, and not just any version of the character, but the universal incarnation licensed by the Lugosi estate. More vampiric goodness followed in the form of Count Orlock, who sports one of Migos' finest outfits to date. He was followed shortly after by Hammer Films' own incarnation of the Count in the bloodshot-eyed form of Christopher Lee. Indeed, as fans, we've been spoiled for choice when it comes to Dracula, but there's one figure that truly stands apart from his undead brethren. Here he is. This is our most recent purchase. (laughs) And uh, it's kind of interesting. In 2019, it turns out that uh, Migo company had come back after uh, several decades of dormancy in uh, 2016, I believe, was expanding its distribution. And um, in the interest of keeping product fresh, they created a sort of ancillary wave. Uh, Some folks call it the European series. Uh, Some folks just call it wave six. Um, I'm not really sure where you come down, but uh, Migo offered a number of redressed versions of previously issued characters. We had the Frankenstein monster, the werewolf, 
There was a Freddy Krueger and a glow-in-the-dark Count Orlock. Now, those were all more or less very comparable to the other uh, versions that Mego had previously released. A little bit of paint deco, you know, maybe some glow-in-the-dark stuff going on, but uh, nonetheless pretty true. But their fifth figure, Dracula, as you can see, very different from the previously released Bela Lugosi version, or the Count Orlock for that matter. Uh, he's got kind of a, uh, what can you say, funky vibe to him. Almost like a Studio 54 thing. What am I talking about? Well, let's crack them open and see what's going on. Don't need Stabby Joe for this one. Actually, the uh, package had already started to separate, so it's as easy as that. We'll get him out of his plastic coffin to reveal his Prince-tastic full-length purple cape and his positively Seinfeldian puffy shirt. That's it. All right, now this guy, he's really something else. Migo decided to, uh, you know, go a different direction than their usual, uh, you know, stoic, very uh, stiff upper lip vampire and give us uh, something a bit funkier. You know, I could see this guy actually coming out during a parliament show in the 70s and blowing the audience's mind. Uh, as you can see, he has this wonderful... Uh, faux silk purple cape and then the other side is like a black velour so very nice once again the uh, puffy shirt in full effect we got the sleeves we got the ruffled collar and uh, very stylish some well tailored pants and uh, pretty much the same shoes that all the other Draculas have, because apparently all the Draculas shop for shoes at the same place. But <laughs> nonetheless, uh, this guy is cast in the glow-in-the-dark plastic, so that uh, makes him extra spooky. They gave him the monster hands, so he's, ah, you know, coming to get you. The sharp-eyed viewer will notice that the head of this particular figure is a reuse of a classic Mego head. Now, from what I understand, this was the Romulan. And uh, Mego decided to uh, dress him up by giving him some rockin' sideburns, a mustache, little goatee, and uh, even some fangs with some painted blood on there. So as far as it goes, he's the most uh, gruesome of all these vampires, because he actually has some blood. I guess Chris does too. This is actually much more like confined into his mouth. It's not dripping. So, you know, we got to give it up to this guy. Here he is. So, uh, Dracula by way of, uh, Andy Warhol, if you will. So, yeah, we'll put him right there. He'll join the party. You know it. Larry, should I use the vampire blood now or later? He said later. Man, I can't wait to use this stuff. Okay. Oh, I see that uh, naked Woody Harrelson is here. Or is he? Is that you, Woody? Seems to be uh, very much in the spirit of the thing with his uh, black cape, spooky black top hat, and a skull mask obscuring his identity. So, all right. This guy, he's always got something going on. Okay. Well. This is Old Guys Who Like Old Comics, and nothing says old comics like some old magazines. <laughs> Here's Dracula Classic. This is from 1976, and this is for a new generation of vampires, like the Pepsi generation. Uh, we got the blood-sucking vampire from Transylvania, a history of vampires, and a feature on Bela Lugosi, the man who made Dracula famous. Image of Christopher Lee in full color. Getting ready to uh, open that lady's dress. Scandalous. This is chock full of photographs from all those vampire films we love so much. And even some pictures of Dracula's castle knocking around Transylvania. The stuff you see. You know, uh, these monster magazines. Actually, at one point in time, you could buy some soil from Dracula's castle in a little... Uh, pendant shaped like a coffin. I miss that one. Hope to get one someday. And then here is Dracula Lives. This is number one, and it's a Curtis publication. That's right, the folks at Marvel decided that they wanted a cut of the black and white pie, and so they jumped in. 
Here we see that they're already announcing their next issue. Very confident, aren't they? This gives you a nice little potential poster for your dorm room there. That'll look good in the red light bulb. And uh, this has a collection of stories featuring Dracula. Some text tales. And then here's Dracula Lives number two. And uh, the Marvel Monster Group. Quite like that. Marvel decided to mix things up a little bit by throwing a third color in to enhance some of these illustrations. And uh, works effectively in some spots. Other spots where it's not used, you feel like, oh, might have been nice to have some orange right there. Haha, <laughs> check this guy out. Mein Gott, it's a Nazi vampire! <laughs> oh, wow. This little old man is a murderer and cannibal. That's right, you could learn all about Albert Fish. Send your 75 cents in today. And then uh, here's the Haunt of Horror. Marvel Preview presents the Haunt of Horror featuring Lilith, the daughter of Dracula. And, uh, well, these two actually look like they could make the scene together. Well, not make the scene together, you know, but... <laughs> Definitely hit the club dressed uh, in a likewise fashion for sure, but it's very nice. And then on the back, learn the secret to teaching yourself music. <laughs> Dig this guy. He's thinking, I'm going to shoot her and then myself. What's going to be in the suicide note? Let us know in the comments section below. Oh, showing a little bit of leg. All right. That's why they charge a dollar for it. There he is, Dracula, Lord of the Vampires. And Lilith has her own story in here, which is pretty good as well. Take a look at that real quick. There she is getting tossed out a window. Where's Spider-Man? Everybody gets one, Lilith. Let's move on to the comic books. Now here's some wonderful pre-code action. This is Adventures Into the Unknown, number 23, from American Comics Group. And when I saw this cover, I knew. I just had to have it, absolutely. I like these representations of vampires that are a bit more abstracted. You know, it's just giant bats, you know, big dark things, creepy things, giant fangs, you know, green noses. <laughs> Count me in. And then here's Archie's Madhouse. These Archie monster covers, highly collectible. I tried to pick up a Jughead monster cover at uh, the shop the other day. 50 bucks! Some more Archie Madhouse. And uh, basically the same gag. Put them together. Which one do you prefer? Or do you like the really stupid one in the middle? And then here is a coverless cutie. This is Dark Mysteries, number five. But I just like this uh, guy here. It's referred to as uh, Bobo the Dwarf, but he's way bigger than both of these people. You know, is Bobo the Giant Dwarf? Uh, can we call this episode Bobo the Giant Dwarf? Here's some Dark Shadows. And uh, I passed on issue one of this a little while back because, once again, you know, it was price prohibitive. Uh, as awesome as the covers are, um, I found that, you know, the inside eh, is just kind of, you know, weak, weak tea. But uh, I do like this. Ruthless criminals fight for control of Collinwood. Stop them, Barnabas. Stop them. And it's the dead of night. And speaking about uh, questionable vampires, are they vampires? Are they ghouls? You'll find the answer in Deep Down. This was a very interesting little era for Marvel when they were uh, basically, you know, reprinting the pre-code horror that they had uh, initially offered decades before. They were able to do that thanks to a relaxation of the comics code. But, um... You know, I prefer the original stories that they offered in the early 70s, much more so. Gave creators like Tom Sutton something to do over at Marvel. Here's Dracula, 
And uh, this is a Dell comic, and man alive, these Dell superhero slash monster comics, they're rough. I know a lot of people really dig them, and uh, some uh, folks have even done some interesting reinventions of the ideas and characters, but, uh, you know, just taken as, as they are. They're uh, pretty cheesy. You're going to want some Ritz and a little bit of wine to go with them. Here Dracula is, and uh, we learn the adventures. Uh, we learn where a secret cave is. We get the origin of Fleeta, and Dracula finds his specialty, which is sucking, of course. And we cover this episode in a previous Comics for Breakfast. Check that out at the link below. You won't want to miss it. And then... Ooh, it's eerie. Yes, it is, folks. Pretty creepy offering from IW. And um, apparently they pulled a switcheroo. As far as it goes, IW, this was a cover that had originally been offered on a Dracula adaptation. But for this, they just uh, slapped it on a book of reprints and called it good. But uh, nonetheless, I quite liked it. I felt that it was appropriate for our little... Dog and Pony show here. And then here's the Flintstones. Meet Frankenstein and Dracula. Like I said, man, it's just like they were everywhere, these monsters. You know, they were ubiquitous. Uh, Drac seems very interested in Wilma. Even though Fred has way more blood. Come on. Next up, do you dare take a trip to Ghost Manor? This comic was among a big stack of quarter Charlton horror that I purchased back in the day when uh, BEM, Bug-Eyed Monster, a comic book store in Wilkinsburg, went out of business. Uh, that's where I cut my teeth on these Charlton horror books. Like I said, I had a big old pile of them, and this one was always my favorite. I had mentioned Tom Sutton earlier, and uh, this is a Tom Sutton cover. Pretty much unmistakably so, but uh, the more I looked at it, the more I thought... This isn't the book that I had back in the day. You know, I bought this as a replacement because those old ones were long gone. But um, as much as I like this, I felt something was missing. This just wasn't the comic book that I remembered. This is the comic book that I remembered. And uh, as you can see, well, there are some notable differences for sure. This, this is very good. But this is next level. I mean, dig that luminous green, that intoxicating purple, and blood, mother, blood. These folks seem to be in way more peril, illuminated as they are in this tiny little uh, oval of uh, warm color while they're surrounded by this dankness. I mean, this one has a miasma. You can smell this cover. It's not just the comic book. Uh, Tom Sutton is in fine form here. This is an actual, uh, you know, Charlton 6P copy. So it's from uh, overseas. So maybe that has something to do with it. But nonetheless, definitely in my top 10 favorite spooky covers. I would put that up against any EC any day of the week. And then, well, we took a trip to Ghost Manor. Would you like to uh, take a journey into fear? Why not? Bags are already packed. These are strange and unbelievable tales. Uh, we've got Partners in Blood, uh, Tomb for Two, and Die, My Darling. And uh, speaking of covers, here's one that would uh, definitely have you tugging on Mom's arm, asking her for a quarter. It's Monster Hunters, and it's more Charlton. Big surprise, huh? They definitely seem to be dialed in as far as a child's uh, vampiric desires go. Dig this guy. What's in the pipe, Grandpa? Don't bogart that thing. And then here's uh, some gold key. And the Occult Files of Dr. Spectre. And this is another book that we talked about in Comics for Breakfast just because it was so absolutely dynamite. And this is a very sympathetic representation of a vampire. This is Baron Tybor. And uh, he's not your typical bloodsucker. You know, he feels pretty bad about what he's doing. And uh, by the end of the issue, well, Dr. Spectre, he's managed to cure him. Spoiler alert. But uh, don't worry, he gets vampy again later. And uh, 
Then it's Planet of the Vampires. Now, I had number one along with two and three, but I gave that away. I keep thinking that I have more of these things that I do, but uh, this is number two. It's an Atlas comic, and as big into Atlas as I am, I always felt that this book tonally just wasn't what I was looking for. It's more like Planet of the Apes with, like, weird mutants who drink blood. There's nothing like this. Savages spacemen you know it's just it wasn't what i was going for now it seemed as though by the end of this issue they were getting ready to move into more of like a gothic uh, classic vampire vibe but well it didn't make it past three issues because it was an atlas comic and then here's a very cool gray morrow cover from red circle comics group quite like that a young howard stern is uh, about to meet Elvira. Their first interview went terribly awry, apparently. But I dig that. These red circle sorceries are always awesome, and you can often find them in the dollar bin. So you would be well advised to look for those. And then we're going to wrap things up with a couple. Tomb of Dracula's, because, well, that seems appropriate, doesn't it? Now, this just came out, and um, it is a facsimile edition of the original First appearance of uh, Marvel Comics Dracula, Tomb of Dracula number one. It's the Night of the Vampire. And you can see right there on the back, it's got the ad for the Fat Track. Don't go uh, out to Toys R Us looking for that, though. They'll probably just think you're crazy. And then you could be taller by cutting yourself in half and jamming a bunch of words into your midsection. We can make that happen for you. Hey, there it is! Vampire blood! Larry, can I use the vampire blood? Soon, he said, soon. So, yeah. It's pretty nice. Now, four bucks, definitely a damn sight more than, what, the 20 cents that it started off as. But if you want a copy of it, you know, if you want a placeholder until you can actually get yourself a nice number one, highly recommend it. And then... Here's Tomb of Dracula number 18, and this is fairly topical as uh, this uh, Werewolf by Night thing it came out about a week ago, and people really seem to enjoy it. So that's a nice change of pace, isn't it, from some of that uh, other Marvel product that's been out lately. Hope that Marvel heads off in that horror direction, because uh, there are so many things that they could do. I mean, a Legion of Monsters movie, anyone? All right, well, thank you for joining us on this uh, spooky ooky edition of Having a Drink with Mink. From myself and all the Draculas, well, I'll see you next time. Cheers. <laughs>